sermon on Let the Rich, okay? We're going to be in John chapter 15 today. John chapter 15. So these chapters, John chapter, uh, we started 13, 14, now we're almost through with 15, and we'll finish up 16 and 17 over the next couple weeks. All these chapters are words that Jesus is speaking to his disciples and in front of his disciples. In fact, the way the scriptures portray them, it says, at this time, Jesus made known to them the full extent of his love. So basically it's saying, this is the very important thing that he had to pass on to the disciples before he went through his trials of being uh, arrested and executed and buried in the tomb, rising from the grave and ascending into heaven. These were the important things, his genius, if you will, the genius of Jesus, to pass on to the disciples. So we made it through uh, chapters 13 and 14 and part of 15, and I want to thank Stacy and all of you for giving me a chance to get away and, and uh, have some spiritual renewal last weekend. Uh, and so we talked about um, the vine and the branches and how abiding in God, we can bear much fruit in our lives and the importance of love and relationships. And today we're in verse 18. We're going to start with verse 18 and read through the first few verses of chapter 16. So Jesus says these words. He says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you, so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things, because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this, so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. So what I'd like to do is just start at verse 18 and kind of go verse to verse and try to help us understand and what this means for our lives. And in the first two verses here that we read today, in verse 18 and 19, Jesus kind of sets up a compare and contrast, if you will. He says... If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first, on the one hand. And on the other hand, he sets up, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. So there's kind of a, an opposition here between the world loving the disciples and the world hating the disciples. And because they love Jesus first and the most, he says, the world will hate you. And he says, if you were of the world and you loved the world first and most, then the world would love you. And I think we see this at work in our world today. I, you can chase after success, fame, notoriety, getting the applause and the notice from other people and make that the purpose for your life. 
And it's not necessarily doing bad things. It could be you're doing lots of good things so that you get noticed by people so that you have more notoriety and everybody thinks that you're a good person. And that you could make that the purpose of your life. And the world will love you. And they will say, you're great, you're awesome, you're wonderful, look at all the good things that you do. On the other hand, you could make Jesus Christ the purpose of your life. To love him first and the most with everything. And Jesus says, people will not like you for it. You will still do good things and great and wonderful things. But because you do them in my name and in Jesus' name, people will ridicule you and persecute. People will say that you're dumb and that God thing doesn't make sense. Alright? So that's kind of the opposition that Jesus sets up. And I feel like these verses right here should be very convicting to me and to each one of us. Because Jesus says, as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. And so when I read these verses, and I hear Jesus say these things to the disciples, and I think, I'm trying to call myself a disciple and a Christian, that means I should be experiencing some sense of hate from the world. Some sense of ridicule, some sense of difficulty. If life is too easygoing and too good and I look too successful in the eyes of the world, then I'm probably not being a disciple the way Jesus wants me to be a disciple. And to me, that should be convicting to each and every one of us who wants to raise the banner and say, I'm a Christian. That if my life is too easy, I'm probably not being Christian that God wants me to be. I'm probably not being the disciple, the follower of Jesus God wants me to be. I may even be going to church and doing lots of good things, but I may not be loving God first and the most the way God wants me to. See how that is? Because if you put God, Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit loving you first and most, the rest of that stuff takes care of itself. Right? And so it can be very convicting because this is so tempting over here. To have the success, to have people who give you attention and like you, to have, uh, you know, nice things, cars, house, clothes, whatever, you name it. To have influence and fame and notoriety. And what we do is we try to stand in the middle and say, I want it all. I want to have enough of that that my life is comfortable and I want Jesus. But Jesus says, you can't have it both ways. You've got to serve somebody. Put God first and the most. Love God most So that's verse 18 and 19. He continues on. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. So he's warning them. He's saying, look, if you're going to be about following me, if you're going to be about teaching my way, you're going to face persecution just like I face persecution. But let, let me tell you, if you stick to teaching Jesus' ways, he says, people will, who know me will obey you too. So he's giving them this encouragement to hang in there, to stick to the Jesus way of life. And what is the Jesus way of life? What is the teaching that he wants people to obey? Well, yesterday in the prayer, uh, Ebenezer celebrating their 175th anniversary this year, and so we had the prayer, the float, and the apple blossom parade. We 
you brought some candy to throw out. And of course, you start out with bread, you're just like tossing handfuls of candy here, there. So what happens halfway through, you run out of candy, right? So I've got no candy, and uh, uh, so what I, I started yelling out, Jesus loves you, and Jesus says love one another. Jesus loves you. Jesus says love one another. And those, that was the way of life that Jesus wanted his disciples to live by. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others just as you would love yourself. To love your neighbor, to love others as Jesus Christ has loved us. That was the way of life. That is the teaching that Jesus wants the disciples to keep doing, even if you get persecuted for it. And he says, look, the people who love me, they will obey me, and they'll follow along. All right, so he says, they will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. So Jesus said, look, they didn't know any better before, but now I've been here, I've done the miracles, I've explained what I'm all about, what my teaching is, they have a chance now to accept or reject. And so they, now they are without excuse. And he continues, he who hates me hates my father as well. He who hates me hates my father as well. And this is about the third or fourth time we've heard this verse, hate, here. This word hate in these verses. And many of us, we teach our kids, don't ever say that word hate, you know, unless you really, really, really mean it. And hate is not a word that we're trying to pass on. Hate is not an action that we're trying to pass on to people. So why is it that Jesus is talking about hate so much in the passage? Well, first of all, I want you to remember this words on this page are in English. The scriptures were not originally written down in English. So somebody saw the word written in Greek and said, hey, hate is an English word that means what I think this author meant to say. And so they translated it as hate. So I looked it up, and because there's other places where Jesus uses this idea of hate, and he says things like, unless you hate your mother or father, unless you hate your brother or sister, you cannot be my follower. <clears throat> Trying to say, you have to put me first, even to the point of leaving your own family behind. Right? So, as I was trying to figure out what does Jesus mean when he's saying this word hate, one of the things I came across was it may not mean hate exactly the same way that we think about hate. It could simply mean this, to love the least. To love the least. And so when Jesus says, he who hates me hates my father as well, he's, he's saying, look, if they, love, if they don't love me, they love me the least in their lives, and they're not loving God either. And he's saying, if I had not done among them what no one else can do, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father, and listen to verse 25, but this is to fulfill what is written in their law. And this is very important to see what Jesus has just done here, to say this is what is written in their law. Because now he has said that the Jewish law and the people who love that the most, and put that first, are a part of this worldly way. You see that? Jesus has just, by saying to fulfill what is written in their law, he has just taken his own ancestry, his own religious tradition, his own way of thinking and knowing about this world that he was raised up in, and said they love that law more than they love and it just blows me away to think about Jesus doing that. Because the law was meant for good things. In fact, the commands that Jesus proclaimed were to love God and to love one another, they're there in the book of Leviticus. 
And Jesus is saying, that's what it's all about. But because you love the law and getting notoriety of trying to fulfill that law and see how good of a person you are, you love that more than the Heavenly Father, you love that more than me. It's as if you hate me. Because you are lowering God to the least. And so, you've heard people say the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. He's like, you love the letter of the law so much that you miss the spirit of it. You miss the love that God is trying to share. So he said, this is to fulfill what was written in their law. They hated me without reason. Then, verse 26, he says, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth that goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So if we just look over this section of scripture that we've been reading, he's basically giving them a warning, saying, look, following me and following my ways and my teaching will be difficult and hard. You may get picked on and insulted, persecuted, and even killed for it. But a counselor, a helper, an advocate, a friend, my very presence will be with you to empower you so that you do not quit. Don't give up, Jesus is saying. I am with you. I am with you. It's as if Jesus is saying, giving your life to this purpose of loving God first and most is worth it. Whatever you face, it is worth it. And I will be with you to prove it to you. He says, all of this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue in fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills will think he is offering a service to God. So this idea about being kicked out of the synagogue, remember, the Jewish religion, it was like a family. So if you were a part of the synagogue, if you were a part of the worshiping family, you were a part of what God was doing. If you were kicked out of the synagogue, you were kicked out of the family, you were cut off from what God was doing. And so we see things like Jesus doing miracles and healing blind people, making them walk again. And they go to the synagogue thinking, hey, I've been clean, I've been made whole and healthy again, right? Because obviously, before, they were dirty and unclean and sinful, so they were kicked out of the synagogue. So they, once they get healed and clean, they go back. And you know what happens? They tell them, hey, Jesus did this. They were like, wait a second. I'm glad that your eyes are better, but Jesus can't be doing stuff like that. You're out of here. And kick them out of the synagogue again. And so Jesus is saying, look, you too will get kicked out, ridiculed, persecuted, cut off from God's word, cut off from God's family, at least in the eyes of the world, right? In the eyes of their law, in the eyes of the synagogue, right? But Jesus says, look, they will do such things because they don't really know God and they don't know me. So Jesus is saying through all of these verses, he's like, I've told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you, and you will remember that I said I will be with you, and you will not go astray. You will be able to stick to it, not give up, and not quit. Because Jesus is trying to say that giving your life to loving God and loving others, you know, or as he says in the, when he teaches the disciples to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name, he says, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Giving your life to that vision of the world is worth it. It is worth it. And you can face whatever may come your way. If you've put God first and most, God's love first and most, it's worth it. He says, oh, I will be with you always even to the end of the age. So it kind of comes down to, if you have to put all of your eggs in one basket, do 
You want them in a basket that's going to disappear and be destroyed in the world? Or do you want them in the one that lasts forever? For God is love. God is love, and his steadfast love endures forever. And everyone who loves is born of God. We, we may fail. Like I said, it's convicting to hear Jesus say these things and realize maybe I'm not being the disciple I could be. But I'm not going to give up. I know that Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is with me, with you, with each one of us, saying, let's do this. Let's testify. Let's show the world how good and awesome God's love is. Don't give up. It's worth it. It is very much worth it. And as I was riding through the parade yesterday, I don't know how many thousands of people were lined up on the side of the street, you know, from from going down Frederick Boulevard at Noise, all the way downtown past the Felix Street Square down there, Coleman Hawkins Park. And uh, just Thousands of people lined up. And I couldn't help but think, how many of those people need to know a life worth living? Need to know a love worth giving? That they can wake up in the morning and be assured and know the depth of God's love. Or do they wake up in the morning and say, what's happening? You know, like, do I have a purpose? It's my only purpose to go out and get what I can and take what's mine and step on anybody else that gets in my way. Because if I don't go get it for myself, nobody's going to get it for me. And it's a dog-eat-dog world. You know what I'm saying. To me, I want to see people so aware of the abundance, the abundance of God's love and mercy. That it spreads throughout all the earth. Because people have said, God's love is first and most. And then how do we show God's love? But to love one another. That is a life worth living. That is a purpose to give our hearts to. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for this teaching of Scripture. We thank you for your abundant mercy and grace. How it changes our lives. Help us to not give up. To know and be aware of your presence. Empower us to live as your faithful disciples. And not give in to the temptation of worldly success. And then the praise of human beings. But God, let us seek your praise. Let us seek your honor. Let us seek your holiness and righteousness. Let us seek your justice. Your love. May we love you first and most. May that love be poured out through our lives into the lives of others. That the whole world can see your greatness your goodness, your mercy, your love. Oh God, forgive us for how we fall short that we are not the disciples that we could be. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We come back to you now. Confessing our sin, our shame, our guilt, our brokenness. Confessing our need for you. Pour out your love and grace. Pour out your mercy. Make us aware of your forgiveness. Wash us clean. Set us free. To love you first and foremost. And to love you just as Christ loves the church. Amen.
honor and glory are yours, God. 